thanks to all of you out in uh, video land who joined us today. We are very excited to be able to talk with you about our high school benchmarks report. I'm going to share my screen and Ron and I will introduce ourselves. So I'm Doug Shapiro. I'm the executive director of the National Student Clearinghouse Research Center. And I've been working in education research for around 20 years, first in Michigan, then Minnesota and New York. And I joined the Clearinghouse back when the Research Center was first formed in 2010. And three years later, we created the very first high school benchmarks report as part of our nonprofit mission to provide independent, objective research using Clearinghouse data for the benefit of students, educators, and the broader public. So I'll turn this over to Ron to introduce himself, and then we'll come back. Thanks, Doug. Aloha, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. My name is Ron Nozoy. I am fortunate to be with the National Association for Secondary School Principals. I'm a lifelong educator. I've served in a number of roles, starting with teacher and moving all the way through, you know, principalship and district superintendency, the state deputy superintendent, and was very fortunate to serve at the national level of the United States Department of Education. On behalf of NASSP, it's our pleasure to partner with the National Student Clearinghouse and, of course, Doug and Rita uh, on this exciting and super important work. And I look forward to engaging with you and talking about what we're seeing and what we're learning and learning from you, and especially to learn about what questions you may have. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Doug. Thank you. All right. I'm going to go back to my slide share. And so I want to talk about this benchmarks report that we released uh, last month. And it's important to start out with just some introductory information that this is very different uh, from our standard annual report. We typically wait a full year for all the data to be collected from both the high schools and the colleges before we try to match them up and see which students enrolled where. And that would ordinarily mean that this fall we would show the 2019 high school graduates entering college in their first fall after graduation. That is still in this report, but we've also done something entirely new. We've added an extra feature in response to the unprecedented changes brought on by the pandemic to provide an early look at the results for this year's graduates. First time, first fall enrollments for the class of 2020. And it's really important to note that these are preliminary results. It's a smaller sample than we would normally release. In fact, a smaller sample than what you would be seeing in your own school or district's high school benchmarks, uh, student tracker for high schools report. And this, these results will be revised later with more complete data. But we felt the findings were so important for educators to understand now about what's happening and what we might be able to do to help address it in this uh, climate. So at the highest level, here's what we found in our, in our first look report. To begin with, we saw the same number of graduates this year as last year. So students didn't drop out of high school due to the pandemic last spring. They didn't fail to graduate, but they did fail to show up at college. And they did so in large numbers. Over one fifth of the graduates who would have been expected to show up based on how many came from their same high schools last year never made it to college this fall. And it's pretty clear that these declines are due to the pandemic and the recession, and that they are much larger for already disadvantaged communities who have lower college enrollment rates to begin with. This was true regardless of whether we looked at low income, high minority, or urban high schools. We saw larger declines in every case compared to their more advantaged peers. And that means that the gaps in enrollment rates between those schools and students from higher income or lower minority communities grew wider 
gaps in college enrollment. So I'm gonna show just a few charts for the visual learners out there to illustrate these numbers and talk a little bit more about the details. This first one is a very simple chart. It's got the year over year percent change in the number of graduates enrolling in college. And what you see first is a small decline of just a few percent last year in 2019 and a much bigger decline this year, 22% on the right. Now we assume that that 2019 decline was due to the underlying demographic and economic trends pre-pandemic. And most of those are long-term trends that have been in place pretty much since the end of the Great Recession. And the 2020 decline on the right over and above that trend is the combined effect of the pandemic and the economic crisis and everything else that we've experienced in the last 12, last 10 months. And this 22% is truly huge. In all the years that we've been producing the High School Benchmarks Report, we've never seen ever a change of more than two, at most two and a half percent in a single year. And most of that 22% drop this year is attributable to fewer students going to community colleges where the numbers of freshmen are down about 30 percent whereas there are only about 14 percent fewer high school graduates going to four-year public colleges this year now all of this is from a again a limited set of about 2300 high schools we've matched their graduates against the enrollment files from about half of all colleges and universities the ones that had also sent in their regular data to the clearinghouse in time for this study. It's exactly the same high schools and exactly the same colleges in each of the three years that you're comparing here, 2018, 2019, 2020, just so you understand what we're talking about. This will be updated with more complete data in uh, next month, actually. So here, we're looking at the exact same findings, but I'm disaggregating it by the four different types of public high schools that we track at the Clearinghouse, showing comparisons between students from the poorer, more minority, and more urban location high schools, these are the orange bars, compared to their less disadvantaged peer schools, those are the blue bars. And again, in every case, you see small declines of a few percent in 2019 on the left side of each chart, regardless of school types. In fact, the drops are slightly smaller among the disadvantaged schools in 2019. You can see that uh, the, the orange bars on 2019 are smaller than the, than the blue bars. And that shows the relative gains last year of, of lower income schools graduates compared to the blue bars. But the declines that you see in 2020, again, they're much larger and they're far steeper for the orange bars than the blues. So for example, on the upper right, the declines for high poverty high schools are about 33%. That's twice as large as they are for low poverty schools. So a typical high poverty school that might have sent, say, 60 graduates to college last year would have sent only 40 students this year. And the decline was 26% for high minority schools on the lower left, almost 50% larger than the comparable drop for low minority schools at 18%. There's less of a disparity between the urban schools and the rural or suburban categories, but they're still declining by about 25% or six percentage points more than the others. And this is, these are all roughly in line with what we've seen in the numbers of first time freshmen generally enrolling in college in the research centers uh, college enrollment reports this fall. Those reports include freshmen of all ages, as well as students coming from private high schools, international students, etc. But having the high school match that we do in this report just puts a finer point on who those missing freshmen are. It's really important to have that context. So you can download a full free copy of the report at our website. And that's all I want to share right now, and we'll go into uh, the discussion. So I will stop sharing my screen. And what I'd like to start with is 
just a, a really reaction question from you, Ron. How do you, how do you feel about what these data are telling us? Thanks, Doug. And thank you very much for putting the slides up and talking us through them. The first slide, you know, about um, generally, you know, the data was pretty much unchanged about the high school graduation rate. We all went through a crazy year last year. And, you know, it's a tremendous credit to everyone involved, students, families, especially the seniors and their families, the educators, the teachers and advisors, and of course, administrators, principals and assistant principals, of course, the district support staff. I mean, the whole K-12 ecosystem kind of banded together to you know, save our seniors last year. Um, and a personal note, I'll talk about it a little later. My youngest son was one of the, you know, affected kids uh, last year. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a really an accomplishment that we were able to, you know, maintain and keep these kids moving forward. But then as Doug, you know, pretty much maintained the graduation rate. But then as Doug pointed out in those four disaggregated slides, you know, the, the, uh, all of us that have worked at, you know, trying to eliminate achievement and opportunity gaps and, and really focusing in on our equity, you know, we know how hard that work has been. And sometimes we beat ourselves up a lot over it because of the, the, you know, the disparity and the dissonance between the two. But as you can see from the slides that Doug put up, we were, you know, making some progress. And for it to go south as far south as it did with the, you know, with kind of like a three shot swing in golf, if you're a golfer, you know, you were one up and then you lost the stroke and then the other person gained their stroke. And we've now created this, well, we're now experiencing this big gap. And so the takeaway really is, you know, that the data is showing us very clearly that we have a, a, a problem, not just with the college going the immediately, you know, the seniors from last year and this year's seniors, and of course, juniors, and, but we've also got this, interrupted education gap or you know phenomenon that's started with kindergarten last year in pre-k and it's going to matriculate all the way through the system so while we're focusing today on our high school you know juniors and seniors that are getting ready to to go into you know post-secondary education or life in the workforce we're also dealing with uh, uh, at the elementary level of a cohort of kids that's going to come up through uh, and you know, start to we'll start to feel the effects of them. Well, we're already feeling them at those levels, but we'll feel them move all the way through the system as we go forward. And so, you know, really the big takeaway is that you know, because of the interrupted education, you know, people want to talk about learning loss and sort of a deficit mindset. But I, we like to think about it like, what are we going to need to do for kids to make sure that they are ready for life and the workforce and beyond? And I think that's on the mind of everyone on this call here, and I'm thankful for so many people to join it because this is really an important, these are really important data points, especially uh, with the you know, a new administration in the White House and us going through the pandemic together. So again, I'll back up and just say the big takeaway is, you know, we need to mind this, mind, M-I-N-D, this data really carefully and unpack it and focus really on what can we do going forward to provide kids with additional opportunities for them to not just, you know, catch up, but really for them to take this opportunity to get ahead. And so I'll talk a little bit more as we get into it, but I'll yield it back to you, Doug. Yeah, it's really important to to think about the the implications of this, as you said, both for the students that are going through it now, but also for the students who are coming up behind them. And and the third side, from my perspective, where I spend most of my time looking at college uh, uh, enrollment and, and completion and success data is, is what it might mean for these students who don't sh didn't show up in college this fall, what it might mean for them in the long term. I mean, what really frightens me is the implications for uh, those students and their, and their families and, and for our, our nation, for our, for our national economy and, and um uh and and communities with potentially a generation of workers with uh lower skills reduced educational attainment um lower employability and productivity um what 
what does that look like from your perspective in, in the kind of communities that you serve? One thing is for sure, schools have been and are moving in the right direction, you know, and, and I think this focus on, you know, you can call it what you want. You can call it, you know, inquiry-based learning, problem-based learning, scenario-based learning. You can call it, you know, uh, real-world learning, internships, authentic learning, but schools have moved uh, in this direction um, in, a, in a very positive way. And I think what that has done is created these either well-developed or the beginnings of well-developed relationships between K-12 and higher ed. Um, and, you know, just as a footnote, Doug, you know, we're all on the call. We're all aware that, you know, college going rate and college attendance and college graduation is just one set of measures. There are other measures of success for, for student mm -hmm. success. But for the sake of this conversation, we've seen this trend of schools moving in that direction. And I think, you know, from an implication standpoint, from where we, where what our members are saying uh, at NASSP and what we hear from principals all over the country uh, in, in our, uh, our partner, uh, NAESP, Elementary and Secondary Principals Sister Organization, is that schools are doing everything they can possibly do to move the kind of learning away from the old Carnegie unit, you know, seat time kind of base learning and make the learning experiences more authentic. And this is, the, this is a great opportunity for us to capitalize on technology in that way, where a lot of the things that schools struggle with at the secondary level, for, for example, for authentic learning are, you know, clearances to be able to have kids off campus in businesses doing internships and so on and so forth. There's a lot of security and privacy issues uh, related to those, and especially dealing with minors. But we're hearing and seeing schools that are doing virtual internships, and, you know, are actually getting a lot of, got a, getting a lot of positive traction now because kids are turning and employers are turning into this sort of workforce investment because they know that the, this gap, as you were referring or referring to earlier, Doug, the skills gap and this interrupted education gap from the most recent last year's graduates and soon to be this year's graduates. The employers know that, um, you know, just like we don't want to have kids interrupted education, they don't either. And so I think there's an opportunity for clearinghouse data like like the ones we're talking about today yeah. to really become front and center in these conversations about really addressing the problems that we're having. And so long story short, you know, things like early college opportunities, dual credit opportunities, you know, advanced placement courses, international baccalaureate, uh, opportunities that go beyond uh, these sort of traditional learning experiences. Uh, mm -hmm. Schools that have been moving in that direction are definitely um, you know, I'm sure that as, as much as difficult as it is, they're probably thanking thanking themselves quietly saying, I'm glad we did that when we started doing it because it's it's an opportunity now for kids to stay engaged or increase their edu uh, their engagement and in their education when the traditional systems are you know not as strong because of the lack of in-person um, education. They're not as strong as they used to be. So um, but we can talk more about that. I'll stop talking. Yeah. Come back to you. Yeah. Well, you know, you pointed out the val that the value of the clearinghouse data is in being able to see the outcomes, what's actually happening now. Um, but then the question becomes, you know, what can we, what actions can we take to address it? What can we do about it? In particular, I I wonder about, um, you know, the students who are no longer in the system, uh, the the students who have now left high school they've left that kind of supported community that was uh in some ways designed to help them make this transition into mm -hmm. college mm -hmm. and if if we want to try and get them back on track back into uh the the college pathway um how do how do we do that how do we reach them well, well a couple of things one um you know, this is the this is the time where local relationships matter a lot, because everyone on this call, uh, you know, looking through the the list of uh, participants, everyone on this call has connections with the the levels of education that you know that feed into their systems, and then that they you know they feed out to to other systems, and so you know it's very um, I think that having these conversations around facts 
you know, taking the data sets and looking at them and talking about them is, is super important. And I, I know that's why all the folks that participate in these calls are on the calls today. So, but I want to really underscore the importance of those relationships. And and where I think there's a lot of ground to be to be made is in this intersection between K-12 and the two-year uh, community mm -hmm. colleges. Because community colleges have always served as that bridge from, from K-12 to higher ed. I mean, to, you know, four-year. But because of the pandemic and because of what, what we've all experienced in terms of, you know, the questions about, geez, should we send our kids to college as a parent? This is the conversation my family had. Should we send the kid, should we send my youngest away to college or should we do a gap year or should we enroll him in the local community college here? Hawaii has a great community college system and it's a unitary higher ed system as well. Should we send him here, save money, keep him close to home? You know, these are the opportunities where um, community colleges are much more affordable. They're much more locally based. They're, you know, they're much more familiar to the community. So in terms of, um, you know, making sure that kids move from one stage of development in K-12 into the next phase of their development, whether that be for vocational or the trades or for, for uh, you know, two or four year degrees or straight into the workforce, that people know that they can go to um, these two years in order to, um, you know, like a safe place where they can go to, to continue their education. And so opportunities to collaborate at the at the very local level to share information. Remember, like a, a lot of kids that have graduated have siblings in K-12 schools. So, you know, we might not have the direct pipeline to those families who have left the K-12 system, but we definitely can get out the word through community, through our news outlets, through our local uh, community organization partners. Um, and so, again, it goes back to the value of having these conversations at the local community level and talking about these needs and educating people using these. I saw people asking for the slides. I feel like I told you people are going to, those slides are going to be gold. <laughs> Taking those slides or or graphic depictions of the challenges that we've got and bringing them into these conversations and saying, look, I just got off the a call and learned, the, you know, the most recently released factual data from the clearinghouse and educating people about the what the data is telling us. Yeah, it's really interesting what you said about the community, the, the community, the importance of the community focus and the community colleges especially because so many people at the beginning of this pandemic last spring in the higher education community were, were thinking, just like you suggested, that we would see a lot more students going to community colleges this fall, not less, um, because they're closer to home, people were afraid to travel, uh, because they're less expensive, people didn't want to pay uh, four-year college rates for an online educational experience that you could just as well get at your com local community college, all these sorts of reasons. And, uh, and it raises questions for me about what are the real, what, what are the real driving constraints or forces that have prevented so many high school graduates from enrolling in community colleges this year? I'm sorry, Doug, I was focused directly on the what's going on in the chat here. I'm sorry, I, my, my ADHD is killing me here. So just give me a moment. I wanted to, to, to comment on the conversations that's going on here in the chat. Sure. Um, and uh, this is from from Jenna wrote, wrote to everyone, you know, about I completely agree that, that you know, kids and I'll take a moment of personal privilege here to, as I said earlier, my my youngest son was a was a senior last year and graduated. And we, you know, as a as a bad example of parenting, you know, I, I was really nice with, I think I was really nice with everybody, all the kids I ever served in, in the different capacities, but I was really hard on my own kids. So, you know, torturing my kids and, you know, you're going to go to college and you're going to, and, you know, my, we literally, for the first time ever in our family history, we're like, should we just keep them home? It's not safe. You know, we don't know what the question mark out there. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, I, I'm, I was definitely afraid that if we didn't send him off to college, he might not start. Uh, this is going to Beverly's comment here. So we decided, you know, after long, you know, we seriously contemplated the, the gap year because we were worried about, you know, the, the safety factor. And of course, 
didn't want to pay a lot of coffee, didn't want to pay to Jenna's point, didn't want to pay a whole lot of tuition for education that might have just been kind of like a bunch of online classes. And, you know, we eventually sent him off there, but it made me think, and then now, you know, we were fortunate to have the means to do that. But what if we didn't? And this is, goes right back to your slides, Doug, about, um, you know, the, those that are most vulnerable or hardest hit. And hence my reason for, for talking about why, you know, reducing the barriers to entry or, or it's, you know, better yet, creating these direct pipelines from, from, from in high schools, from the early college opportunity or dual credit opportunity so kids can get a taste and start to earn college credits while they're in high school and mm -hmm. or shepherding them and helping them really, you know, literally guiding them into the two or four year programs that are in their nearby communities. Um, and then of course, working with the incoming administration on what kind of financial assistance will be available for families who, who can't afford college, but know they need to either get back on the cycle to get them in or to, um, you know, fast forward kids in uh, so that we, we can actually extend the educational beyond K-12. Doug, I'm sorry, I skipped your question and responded to what was going on in the chat. No, it's good. It's a, you know we're 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 trying to have an inclusive uh, multi multi pronged conversation here with uh, with uh, with you and I and and the audience and um, some of the some of the chat questions and comments are are really on point as well. I mean, I think I think you're absolutely right in pointing out the the observation that you know this is not this is not not a lost generation yet, and that that no. you know there's still there's certainly uh, time for them to get uh, back on track to to um, uh, kind of re uh, engage with their their college aspirations once the um, the immediate issues of the pandemic and the recession uh, hopefully start to recede. Um, but in many ways, you know, when I think of the 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 students who you know, you hear a lot about. Uh, more affluent students who are taking gap years this fall or this year from, you know, uh, elite colleges and universities. And mm -hmm. I think that's a very different phenomenon from what we're talking about with uh, students from low income families uh, or first generation families who've, who've really uh, lost a, a, a very important window of opportunity yeah. because they're on the, you know, um there's a fear that 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 group is much more at risk of not getting back on track i don't have any concerns at all about the first group they're going to return to college as as soon as it's safe to do so um but the students who really need or or benefit the most from the kind of focused structured guidance and assistance uh that uh students get in high schools um and a lot of community access organizations, as you talked about, to help them uh, um, bridge the, the, make the transition from high school to college. Uh, you know, the advisors who reach out and check in and keep them on, on track and keep them up with their deadlines and financial aid applications and application deadlines and, and exams and, and, and sh showing the, their high expectations that they have for these students. It feels like the longer these students are away from that supportive high school environment, the greater the risk that, you know, life happens and and then college doesn't. And we've seen that in a lot of the in a lot of our traditional college data, even outside of the pandemic, that the longer students delay, the longer students wait um, after high school before trying to enroll in college, the less likely they are to ever uh, start college, and um, so that's where I'm, I, I I find some of my my worst fears about what yeah. what we're seeing in the data. Well, you know, Doug, as you point out, the this is goes beyond far beyond just the class of 2020. So, yeah. you know, the Georgetown um, University Center for Education and the Workforce just reported that 75 percent of the U.S. households put secondary plans on hold during the pandemic. And as you uh, very keenly pointed out a number of times, you know, that it's completely disproportionate to 
you know, there are you know, certain populations are dramatically disproportionately affected by by those decisions. And I think, in, you know, as all of us who have fought the good fight to get, you know, first generation college going kids seamlessly signed up and aware, and you know, all of us who have put time and energy into these, we 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 all know that the the infrastructure around that at the k-12 at the k-12 site especially at the high school site is a challenge you know we've got mm -hmm. guidance counselors with you know unmanageable loads workloads case loads we've got you know good people working themselves to, to you know bleeding fingers and you know to, to do everything they can possibly do to help kids with their applications and the common app and scholarships and all of that stuff and it really but you know those are kind of I don't think there's any, I, I've not met a school that will tell me that they've got enough staff and enough capacity around that area because they're balancing that with making sure that they've got, you know, comprehensive offerings for kids and class size and all that. So this is something from an advocacy level, and, and you've seen it in in not just NASSP's advocacy work, but we are we are going hard with the with the administration and the folks on the Hill to think far beyond just sort of, you know, the COVID relief packages are, you know, it's one thing to think about like, what do we need to do to backfill the hole that, that exists because of the current impacts of COVID? It's another thing to think about, what do we anticipate that hole becoming if we just continue to invest only what we invested before on it? So, you know, if a, if a high school has, you know, a couple of folks maybe in the, in the you know, sort of career and guidance counseling, I, I don't mean like, strictly like counseling in general, but I'm talking about specifically about college and career counseling. You might have a couple of folks in there, but you know, with this kind of outreach, especially for kids who are already find it difficult to even get information and now maybe have a little, you know, less connection physically with the school and maybe are harder to find because of the internet and broadband mm -hmm. challenges. That kind of outreach has to be very personal and we can't expect schools to just do pull it out of the hat and say, oh, look, we found five more FTEs to do this work. This is a real, like, it's a real issue and a real crisis for our country. And we need to have a collective voice to say, look, we, in order to ensure that our country has the kind of workforce and labor force that we need, a highly educated, highly motivated, really well put together sort of workforce, folks got to pay attention to this because it starts at the at the K-12 level. I mean, it starts at 3K level, but it really starts at the K-12 level where all these, these minds and pathways are shaped. And so pushing very hard collectively to, one, educate people about the data that the clearinghouse is showing us. Two, having these community conversations with people to educate them and start to create these sort of venues for the conversation. Many of you already do this in your day jobs and have already been doing it for a long time. So we've got a leg up there. But three, then really marshalling our voices together to stay the same thing. You know, this needs to be invested in. We're going to need more support at the K-12 level. We're going to need more investment in this K-12 to sort of P-20 articulation. And then definitely with the, up, the upcoming um, reauthorization of the Higher Ed Act, opportunities to really talk about higher ed reaching down into K-12. We spent a lot of time thinking about how we can push kids into higher ed, but how is higher ed coming on the other end from a reauthorization standpoint, thinking about how they can really reach out and support K-12 schools in different ways. So you know, lots of ideas out there, but it's gonna all start with education and people understanding the facts to be able to have the conversations using their relationships. Yeah, your point about higher ed having to, having to kind of reach across the divide as well, I think is really important. Um, and, there, and there are some other comments, you know, talking about, I'm just noticing in the chat, this uh the monumental challenges on the kind of infrastructure the guidance and advising infrastructure that you talked about and their their uh how much under resourced they are even in a normal year dealing with the current graduating class there's kind of a, a triple uh burden being added this time because now they're if you will they're trying to uh add on last year's class so now they're dealing with two classes at once and essentially also having to do all that virtually when we know from a really interesting comment from us uh, that sarah uh, it's hard enough to do this when you have a personal face-to-face -face 
with your students, right? But to have to try and get them to engage in thinking about college and all the all that's involved in that, and all you have is you know uh, online video chat um, seems seems really daunting. Everyone here on the call knows that it, not to be cliche, but it does take a village, and this yeah. is not going to be solved by any one of us all alone. This is the, the, the challenge is so great uh, and affecting an entire generation of kids that it's gonna take really all of us to band together and, and you know, if we were to think about it from a, like a national strategy to back map it off of what do we need? We want the best, most prepared, healthiest, you know, most uh, safe and secure and well put together workforce going forward. We need to re-engineer the entire system to create that because we're still, you know, living the effects of the sort of industrial schooling model. And you can see in the chat, people are talking about these alternative, you, you know, those are kind of like in spite of the, these different approaches that people are employing and experiencing success as people are writing in the chat. Those are kind of like in spite of, not because of our current system. And we need to flip that on its head and, and yeah. really engineer our system to be because of not in spite of you know it's it's great and people have been have been very entrepreneurial and very uh, you know out the box. I mean it's hard enough to do it inside the box. So you know we need to invest in that sort of creating these environments where people can you know get out of the box and start talking about things from a uh, you know a backward backward design where if, if we want a certain kind of graduate, then we need to re-engineer the systems to create that. And of course, then we need to invest in the workforce to be able to deliver those opportunities. So that's a lot to contemplate today, but I think I yeah. just wanted to tag onto what you were saying, Doug, is you know, no one, no one, I mean, you've got a nice community of folks here who, you know, participate with the clearinghouse and these kind of affinity groups or these communities of people that are like-minded that share the same sort of passions. That's the way we're going to get these movements off the ground. It's not going to be something that's going to be legislated. It's not going to be something that somebody is going to be in some decision making place and write it on a thing and hand it down from on high. It's not going to be like that. These are going to be grassroots efforts in partnership with national organizations who can bring people together and get all these perspectives to the table. Yeah, yeah. Also makes me wonder about um, the some of the context of the data. When we look at our numbers in the clearinghouse, you know, we're not actually talking, we're not surveying students or educators, we're just looking at administrative data. Um, you know, how many students graduated from high school, for example. You know, when I think of all that was going on in the schools in the spring and what we heard about, you know, um, uh, giving students a lot more leeway than they might ordinarily have had in in-person classes because uh, teachers and uh, uh, schools were, you know, really trying to recognize the immense challenges that a lot of the students were experiencing at home and with their families and all the situations going on with the health and employment and the economy, um, that, that they didn't always show up to class and sometimes that just had to be okay, or they didn't always do all the assigned work and sometimes that just had to be okay what does that what how does that look from your perspective in terms of um uh what what does it really mean to have graduated from high school in spring of 2020. you know my family and i had this very discussion Doug. we <laughs> you know we because we wondered you know everybody was doing their best to sort of respond and react to the situation and you know of course balls got dropped and you know mm -hmm. no fault of anyone's i mean this is just we, we all are living through it still but you know the best way i can explain it is you know it's not what's taught it's what's learned you know and this is the i'll go back to what i said earlier about these opportunities for for like academy structures in schools where you've got these you know schools within a school or smaller learning communities within schools that sort of create these environments with kids where they do feel connected. Uh, you know, talking to principals all over the country, that's where, you know, where, where they have these environments where the 
the kids and their teachers or teams of teachers or their their house if you will or their academy or or their particular you know pick your favorite you know thing where where they had a, a group of kids and a, an adult that were or adults that were together and you know had developed these relationships those relationships continue to carry kids through this and so you know kids who had been connected that, in that way while the the learning was interrupted from a you know in person perspective because they were already on a trajectory those kids had a better shot at uh you know really really staying engaged and continuing their learning because they were already on this trajectory of like it, it was it wasn't being done to them they were already feeling like they were you know they had agency in their own education and mm -hmm. every kid in our country deserves to feel that and it it's it's you know it's not okay that that's not the case today that every kid should have that and should feel it and but i think and people are chiming in right here i, I completely agree these these kinds of things require a lot of mountains to be moved. And so we need, you know, governors, mayors, you know, leaders with, with, you know, people who control the purse strings, powerful folks to come to step to the table and say, it. you know, you, I said earlier, you can't legislate these things, but, but when people like prioritize them in their, in the, in the ways that they, they conduct themselves and in their conversations, things get done around there, you know, opportunities, uh, get talked about that the tables where decision big decisions are being made and so this kind of um, focus in on the more authentic learning high schools have been moving in this direction for years now some farther ahead than others but high schools in general have been focusing on this um, and I really believe that the pandemic is fast forwarding our the importance of it and is raising the level of awareness about what kinds of programs should be and are being uh, built and, and grown in schools. And so on one hand, I say to all of you who have fought this fight, congratulations. And then the challenge is now's the time when we need to make our voices really heard and, and to be speaking in one voice really loudly about the importance of these kind of I mean, people are just talking about it, strategic business partnerships, you know, early college, middle college, dual credit programs, you know, academy structures, thinking about, you know, career and tech ed pathways as part of the, the ways of being in high schools and creating these sort of smaller, smaller learning communities or smaller houses or academies in schools to personalize the education. That personal relationship is what carries kids and families through this. And, and frankly, it carries educators through it too, because they, educators feel like they're really connected to the students even though it's been the in-person part's been interrupted so yeah I mean, this is a great opportunity for us to continue to or to actually um speed up the trajectory i should say speed up the investment in the trajectory to get us to that outcome yeah absolutely i think i think you you can't say enough uh the need for about the need for um uh advocacy from the from all levels for an increase in the kind of resources that we need to address these problems and particularly uh the kind of scale of resources that can only it seems come from uh from government initiatives uh i also wonder about the data resources since i'm a data guy and one of the things you know that that what we created the high school benchmarks for was to help um uh, educators, practitioners in the schools to have access to the data that they need to um, uh, to to do their role, to perform their roles more effectively, and to really be able to see student by student uh, where they're going, who's gone to a community college, who went to a community college but then dropped out or transferred, and one of the things that we find is that. A lot of a lot of times the clearinghouse data that we provide gets kept at the at the district or school leader level. Um, what do you what are your thoughts on how clearinghouse data that that could really uh, in some uh, some sense could could be more impactful in the hands of teachers and counselors on the ground who actually know the students? Um, can be more more systematically uh, uh, provided or disseminated. I mean, I think you know the the 
you raise a great point. It's you know the public awareness and public education, you know, educating the public, I should say, <laughs> the public education component is is huge. And all of us know that um, in K-12, we don't typically invest a lot in communication. You know, we, we don't have huge communication offices and we don't have the huge communication structures because we prioritize student needs yeah. first. And so, you know, if you had to make a decision about whether you're going to go hire a communications person or staff, a, you know, staff a group of kids or a population that needs more support, that's a no brainer for any any school leader. Right? Any educator will make the, the decision to support kids. But this is one of those where um, the again, taking these data points and talking about them, making these data points become common, like, you know, not like some report, some spooky report that came from somewhere, but really just to talk about them in passing, like everyone on this call today could go back and say, hey, you know, the graduation rate pr stayed pretty constant, but the, our most challenged populations are two times more likely to, to have not gone to college this year than their their non, you know, disadvantaged counterparts. I mean, people people talk to break it down into a personal level, right? Like mm -hmm. communicate it with families. It, you know, when you're uh well, nobody's out in the community, but you know, when we're engaging with other people, like share that knowledge with others, you know, tell them, hey, I was on a call, I was on a webinar, I learned this data, check it out for yourself. We need to, people need to the word of mouth way is the way to spread this. You know, it's a, this has to be in the same way that everybody here is a grassroots advocate for what's right for kids. We need to have that same kind of grassroots thing. And you know, if you think about it, if this were any other event, like if this was a sporting event or something else, some some other thing, people would be talking about it all over the place. But for some reason in America, education is kind of like in a in a separate room. We have our own separate conversation. And I would regard this as one of the most one of the greatest national emergencies that we've we face ever. I'm, I'm not just talking about the interruption of schooling. I'm talking about the impact on our teachers and principals and educators mm -hmm. and district staff. I mean, people are just burnt to the crisp, they're tired and beat up. And this has been extremely frustrating for everyone. And so we really need to raise the, com the profile, community profile of how important or how dire these, these the data points are, are um, you know, what the data is forecasting for us. And you know, shame on us if we if we don't act on it. So I'm I'm saying this to a friendly audience, you know, people that are committed to it, but please do not, everybody on this call, please do not underestimate the power of your voice and your relationships and your connections. You can influence decisions by just getting more people to talk about this data. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if if you're the kind of believer that we think you are because you're you know made the time to come on this call. You need to do your part and, and get the word out and share it with whoever you can and wherever you can and talk about it in a way. You know, if you when things change, you get into appointment, you're talking to your doctor on telemed or whatever, you know, talk to your doctor about it and say, hey, you know, I'm really concerned about the graduation rate and work. Everybody has a graduation story. Everybody's got a niece or nephew or kid that went through it. Everybody's got family members that are being are suffering through this interruption of, you know, the the uh, virtual virtual learning and the lack of in person. So um this these are the kinds of things where you know do not underestimate the power of your voice and your commitment to advocate for what kids need. Yeah. People need to hear you say it because we will forget it if we don't. So important. Sorry, that was a little right. soapboxy. No, you're absolutely right. I mean the power of your voice and and uh, and I'm and I'm saying that to everyone. Uh, on this call, the power of your voice, you can't underestimate that. And, and I would, and I would add to that, that the, you should not underestimate the power of data to amplify your voice, to help you tell that story. And not just the data that comes from the national reports that we publish at the clearinghouse, but the data from your own school and your own district and the data about your own students that you have access to through your student tracker reports so that you can really uh, speak with authority about the facts of which students are the most impacted here, which students are the most uh, affected and in need of additional support to get them out of this hole that we seem to have dug for them. I, th I think that, that um, you know, everyone, everyone can benefit from 
the ability of these data to focus our attention and to really direct the resources that we do have and the resources that we can that we can ask for and demand to make sure that when they when they are provided they have a place to go that's going to that's going to make them uh, get the biggest bang for that buck well uh, this has been a, a truly uh, you know really stimulating conversation it's been it's been great talking with you and i know we have only a few minutes left Rita, do, are there any more uh, questions from the audience that we might have overlooked that we can talk really quickly about? Or is it time to say our farewells? Kimberly asks, how do we circle back around these 2020 graduate students to reconnect with them, knowing that K to 12 personal connections are not there for this graduate? Here in Hawaii, you know, obviously we're a lot smaller, uh, you know, in terms of size of state than just about everybody else just states on the call, but you, but we are, um, you know, an interesting, challenging place. We, you know, we've got uh, 255 schools here across seven islands. Um, one of the schools you can't even get to unless you can uh, get it's privately owned. The island's privately owned. You can't get there without a helicopter. So, you know, there are access challenges that we have here. That while we might not be a large state, we have a very unique set of challenges. You know, like for example going over the Pacific Ocean to get from island to island. So one of the things that happened here right at the you know, pandemic in the beginning was a bunch of folks banded together here at the local and the community level, and they did this whole thing to save the class of 2020. And they worked community organization wide, they put out a bunch of PSAs, they worked, you know, raised some money lo from local philanthropy and then work with the community college and the higher ed system to offer free community college summer school for, for anybody in the any senior in the class of 2020, whether you were staying here or going away, every everybody was offered free college, free community college or uh, University of Hawaii courses. And, you know, it's it's that kind of like community. I, I understand the frustration of people's calls. Like, I'm just it's just me in a school with, you know, Three people in the office, and how are we going to? We sent out a newsletter, and maybe we have an email database, but how are we really going to get the word out? The way to get the word out is to engage your community partners to help lift your voice for you. So, work with your local media outlets, local your you know your radio stations or your your TV outlets, your local community organizations. Start talking about the the you, you know the downstream effects of this because people like oh yeah everybody knows the school got interrupted but people don't always think about what does this mean and this is where educators are especially key you know what this means if we have an interrupted class or cohort of kids going through you know what it means when those kids become the people who are eventually going to sign our retirement checks you know hey i want the best possibly qualified candidate to calculate and pay my retirement when when it's I'm away from it, but when that time comes, so you know we know what that means in terms of this uh, youth development, and so use the opportunities to engage with these other partners who have networks to be able to share that information. That way, it's not you feeling like it's your burden all by yourself. There are other folks in your community that already have the kind of reach and bandwidth and scale and networks and communication channels to get that word out, and you know if. I'm sure that there's, you know, local philanthropic or non-governmental nonprofit organizations in your communities that that are passionate about these kinds of things. And, you know, give them a call, reach out to them, send them an email, say, hey, you know, we wanted to talk about share some data with you, we wanted to talk about these implications. We share a common interest here. This this it's a community effort and no school, nobody should feel like they're in this alone because the problem is a huge community wide one. And I really appreciate uh, you you uh, spending time with us today at the Clearinghouse, Ron. And I want to um, thank everyone else uh, in our audience. Really give a great hand to them for their engagement and um, uh, uh, time today. This was a great session, great conversations, great questions and comments. And um, I hope we can do it again sometime. Thank you, Doug, and I echo your 
uh, praise and, and thanks to all the folks who participated and thanks especially to you and Rita and the Clearinghouse for this partnership and this opportunity to join you here. Um, you know, NASSP is happy to help in any way, shape or form to get the word out and get the message out and empower everyone we can get our hands, you know, get, who will listen to us and you know, <laughs> we can bend their ear and help them, empower them to have their own, their own voice and their own impact in, in uh, changing the uh, trajectory of our education all of our youth. So thank you very much. It's, a, it's been an absolute pleasure and an honor. Thank you. And hopefully next time we'll be under much better circumstances. Sounds good. Stay safe, stay healthy, everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs>